start to make demands and start to give orders, sometimes the adult who is perfectly rational, perfectly capable, capable will accede to those demands only because they're afraid to confront their children because of course they raise their children right and they usually do but they raise their children right and their children wouldn't do anything to them that was contrary to their best interest there however become situations where this one particular parent the, the survivor the widower the widower do become or start to become incompetent there's a procedure to determine that and for the children to actually take control of the assets and pretty much the life of that parent they have to go to court they have to seek guardianship of their adult parent the court will then as when the last caller had indicated there was mm -hmm. a guardian involved mm -hmm. the court will indeed appoint a guardian for the adult to determine number one is the adult competent number two does the adult need assistance number three are there services or things available to the adult which can be given and still allow the adult to remain independent the court will evaluate all of that evidence including the evidence brought forth by the guardian by the parent and by the children and determine whether or not a guardian is appropriate and more importantly is necessary if a court based upon all the evidence deems it necessary for a guardian to be appointed then in that case the guardian who's usually the child or at least in my example would be the child mm -hmm. the guardian then will make those types of decisions where will you live in what manner will you live now you're not going to be living in poverty you're not going to be living in a maytag box in an alley you may wind up in a nursing home however and that determination is made that the adult parent is no longer capable of caring for themselves in an independent living situation in between there are daycare providers there are adult providers who come and give assistance there's any number of variations and steps in between the adult meaning re remaining fully independent on their own alone up to the point where the adult winds up in a, a skilled facility pretty much under the influence and care of the skilled facility personnel well this is uh, th you have answered my question basically, but the, the thing is, sometimes, just as a, when, if you get a public defender, you're probably not going to get as, as, as good a defense as if you could afford to hire your own lawyer, because, simply because it's not the public defender's fault, it's the fact that uh, our courts are so, you don't get much time with your, lots of times you're meeting with your public defender just as you're going in to have your trial. I mean... That, well, that. the public defender's system is broken down because they're exactly. utterly, they're utterly swamped. They, they can't take care of the number of cases they that's have. That's my point, exactly. But, and I, I'm a little worried having a court appointed somebody to uh, make sure that, you, that you're okay because they are so busy and have so many. Well, the, 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 uh, are, are you really going to get good representation? Jim, Jim has made a point here you should listen to. Uh, there is a difference between your uh, lawyer and the person who's in there in uh, what's what's what was the guardian thing? position? Just guardianship, yeah. The guardian makes sure that uh, everything goes okay for the uh, person there, but is not a lawyer. Uh, I understand that, but my yeah. point being because it it, it things are it, it costs so much and so forth, and 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 when you go to court, it, you don't always have a lot of time to prepare because they're going to uh, you you. You're assuming that your ch child is going to be going to court to make sure that you are uh, not within your not screwed. Okay. Yeah, yeah. your proper. <laughs> Uh, is that a term we can use? Yeah, well, the, I wouldn't say it's a bad term we can use. <laughs> uh, actually, one of the things that people really need to do, the public defenders do have a large caseload. They're competent people, by the way. Exactly. You, you made a good I, point I, I wasn't that. putting them down. I'm just saying that no, I understand, because but, of, of the economic. But uh, what you need to do, and it, the, the key to any successful representation is prep preparation. I haven't gone into a trial ever without having been fully prepared to the point that I know what the witnesses are going to say before they say it. Mm -hmm. Cross-examination of a witness isn't based upon 
uh, and you hear it all the time, some of the younger lawyers and even some of the older lawyers, and then what happened, and then what happened? God, you don't need to go to law school or be a trial lawyer to figure out the question, and then what happened? And then, of course, one of the common mistakes is repeating what was said on direct examination. In direct examination, you're getting out the information that's favorable to the other side, obviously. So why would you repeat it so a jury or a judge can hear it a second time? Right. You don't do that. But one of the things that I always tell and always told police to do was make sure you are prepared for your testimony. Make sure you're prepared for your case. When I used to try homicide cases, everyone will verify this, I started usually two months in advance and the last four weeks before trial, I was doing nothing but interviewing witnesses, going over evidence, meeting with the police agencies, so I knew essentially verbatim what I was going to say and what I was going to do and how I was going to do it. Now you can't do that in every particular case depending on the severity of it. When you're talking about an adult losing their freedom, that's important enough that I think you can get the guardian or the, the law guardian and the lawyer to sit down and say, look, we need to be prepared. The, excuse me, the ultimate outcome of this case is very critical to the person it involves. Yeah, life and death. Is it is, in many it cases. is. And I think under those circumstances, you can demand that lawyer be prepared, whether or not they're overworked or not. Even private attorneys that don't have a public job are overworked. Exactly. Uh, it just, uh, it's just a fact of life, but they can always find time to prepare for their side for which they intend to advocate. And yeah. if your attorney's not prepared to sit down to prepare with you, then it's time to start thinking you're, about getting somebody uh, you're else. You're emphasizing the old uh, saw uh, for attorneys, never ask a question you don't know the answer That's to. That's correct. That is correct. <laughs> okay, well, you've answered my Thank question. You. Thank, Thank you, you very Carl. much. I'll, I'll send you $5 if you send me a, a stamped envelope to have a nice dinner over at the uh, Lakeview. And I certainly would enjoy that. Okay, And great. I'd like to just close with saying hello to Mr. and Mrs. B, and everybody have a wonderful weekend. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. Uh, Okay, well, so I guess there's a lot of unfortunate uh, debate and hassle about what to do with a parent who is basically losing it, lost it, or whatever, when you haven't got the money, uh, or doesn't want to go into a facility when they need to go to a facility. This is a complicated issue. It's a very complicated yeah. issue, not only complicated legally, but complicated emotionally, complicated factually, complicated in every conceivable way of life. There can't be anything more heart-wrenching. I was, in a sense, lucky, and it wasn't lucky to lose either parent, but when my mom got Alzheimer's, my brother was here. My brother was able to care for her with the help of adult daycare and with uh, home care providers. But had my brother not been here, I wasn't in a position to provide that same type of care. And even though my mom at the beginning denied that she needed it, she truly did. And That's it's, a a, it, it's a very difficult situation. Yeah. It, it tears at the heart. I know it does because I've gone through it. Okay. we got a couple of calls left uh, That's fine. Uh, and more coming in. <laughs> Good morning, caller. Thank you for waiting. Good morning. Good morning. Um, my question is... Um, Mr. Subject didn't quite answer one of the guest calls about uh, whether or not he would like marijuana be legalized. And I was just wondering if he would also uh, advocate lowering the drinking age to 18. Well, there's a couple different ways to look at the marijuana. They have essentially, I think they need to lessen the penalties to some extent. And if medical marijuana is indeed prescribed, I think we ought to make it available. I don't think there's a large for example, California is a state that has legalized medical marijuana. I don't see that there's a great deal of increase in uh, people going nuts, people going wild. Well, of course uh, not. No, of fact, course not. That's correct. They keep coming in and busting these people, as a matter of fact, from Obama and, and company, and they must feel real proud to take away the marijuana from somebody who's dying of cancer. I know, that's in terrible. great pain. But the one thing that does concern me about legalizing marijuana, number two, well, two things. One is the state, or and then the federal government will use it as a mechanism to increase taxes, so that'll be one problem. It's pretty the, hard to do when you sprinkle a few in your yeah, backyard that's true. and you've got a lifetime supply. Well, that's true, but the other part of it that is disturbing to me and I don't know how you resolve this issue is we're still killing 15 to 20,000 people a year because of drunken driving. I think we've gotten to the point where you're never going to get below that figure because there's a group in any particular endeavor that you can never go below. There's nothing you can do to prevent that further. I agree. But once we get to a point where you legalize marijuana or perhaps other 
substances which are now banned, what happens is, is that you put more people on the road who are under the influence and are unable to handle a motor vehicle properly. So you've got 3,000 to 5,000 pounds of screaming metal going down a roadway which may be on the wrong side, and it may be my wife and my son and my daughter in the car on the other side of the road coming into contact with somebody who has been smoking too much marijuana Actually, because it's now available and legal. It's not, uh, not very likely that they'll be, uh, they have very few accidents from, from marijuana because it doesn't affect you. And you don't take as much. You don't drink a six pack. You, you do a few, few uh, you know, a few uh, uh, puffs off of, uh, uh, some marijuana. Well, that yeah. would be my concern about the legalizing marijuana. As far as the drinking age being 18, it, I have some pros and cons with that too. The pros being, I was 18 when I was growing up and I'll tell you, I probably was on the threshold of adulthood at 18, four years away at Penn State. By the way, I'm a proud Penn Stater, contrary to what everybody thinks about them. I think they're still a great institution, but four years at Penn State I think made me into a true adult. I'm not sure at 18 you can handle all of the responsibilities. Uh, I think though the under, uh, to criminalize somebody who's 19 uh, because they're not allowed to drink legally, that's troublesome to me. Yeah, well, I agree with you because you hear you got a guy who, in a war situation, is killing anybody. He has his finger sometimes on the nuclear weapons of some sort, and he can't have a beer with his dinner. I right. Mean, give me a break. I go to a nice French restaurant and have a glass of wine. And like I said, then you criminalize somebody who's 19 years old. I'm not sure at 19 years old somebody should have a permanent criminal record because they were drinking alcohol. As their fathers did at that age. Well, I did, so. Me too. That sure as how old you are. Yeah, I'm old, old. <laughs> but actually, when I was growing up, when I was first old enough to legally drink, the legal BAC was 0.15. Yep. People, when I tell right. them that, they go, oh my God, was it ever that high? Oh. It sure was. It was 0.15, it went down to 0.12, went down to 0.10, now it's a 0 0.08. Yeah, they're killing us with this. We got Jim uh, subject here. Uh, he's going to close off in a minute because I just got this uh, secret message in my little phone here. We're out of here shortly. Um, do you want to sort of wrap up a little bit? We kind of wandered around and did we talked about things people want to hear. Go ahead. Well, and actually, that's what I particularly like about the program and when I'm with you, Reed, we don't stick to a rehearsed agenda. <laughs> we just kind of speak and we let flow what needs to flow and we answer questions of people who have legitimate concerns and I'm happy to do that. The only time I would be unavailable is when it's leak season again and you're eating them on the air. <laughs> I was, you were always here when I eat. <laughs> oh yeah, I sure was. <laughs> I talk about being under the influence of drugs I couldn't even see when I was driving home from that one. But other than that, I really enjoy coming here. I welcome your questions. I welcome your comments. Uh, I certainly can't answer every question. I'm not, in a, the short period of time, it's very difficult to answer a very complex question. Okay. Give a phone number. Uh, I'm 672-2800. If you want to talk to Jim, I'm sure he'll be happy to help you out. I want to thank some real super special people, including Jim Subject, uh, Chuck Kelsey, Devin Taylor, Chris Burt, Randy Burt, Chris and Randy Burt, and Chris and Chris Ramaker, and Jeff Zook, and Don Zins, and John Hamels, all people who have, sorry caller, you'll have to catch our uh, guest next time, you'll, you'll be in Charlie anyway, right? We'll, we'll catch you uh, on the off lake season. <laughs> Thank you for listening in, guys. And I, I, just as a final word, I want to say, may all that is proud and true and noble abide with you. I'm Reed Powers.